This interview is taking place at Colchester Police Station on Thursday the 16th for the 5th 96. And the time bomb I watch now is 12.54. I'm Philip Norton, a detective constable for the Central Detective Unit, Police Headquarters, Chelmsford, Essex. There's another police officer in the room. It's DC Shakespeare, also from the Central Detective Unit at Essex Police Headquarters, Chelmsford. We're here to interview Michael Steele, and there's another person in the room. I'm Christopher Bowen. I'm a solicitor from Jeeps and Sons here in Colchester. After my client had introduced himself, I have an opening statement to make. And here in the room is... My name is Michael John Steele of Oaklands. That's Anglers Green, Colchester. And before this interview continues by the police, I have something that I'd like to ask you that I understand this morning. Time started at 12.54. I'll start again. I understand this morning that you've had words with my solicitor, Mr Christopher Bowen. And I believe you've told him something to the effect that I intend sacking him and his firm as solicitors once this goes to court. A statement which clearly undermines the confidence between my solicitor and me. It's totally untrue. Did you say that to him? No, I didn't. And that's incorrect. DC Shakespeare? No. What I said, in fact, was quite simply that I understood that on one of your previous trials that you represented yourself and perhaps that you would sack Mr. Bowen and represent yourself on this one. Why? Why did you make such a statement? That statement is clearly undermining the confidence between my solicitor, Mr. Christopher Bowen, who has conducted himself up until now expertly and confidently. Then if there was any offence taken, then I apologise to both you and Mr. Bowen and there was no offence intended. I just wish to clarify what was said when I arrived for the briefing. You, DC Shakespeare, and I'm only talking to you about this because you're the person that made those remarks to me. You inquired as to the well-being of my client. I replied that he was fine. You then suggested that I was aware that my client was writing cuprous notes. I didn't really give you an answer to that. And you then suggested that my client may sack myself and Jeeps and Sons and represent himself. You then asked me if I was aware that Mr. Steele had previously sacked previous solicitors represented himself. As you'll be aware, I replied that even if I had answered those questions, I couldn't possibly answer because there is a complete confidentiality between my client and myself. That's right. You're certainly correct. And you did say that. Thank you very much. You did. I'd like to confirm that. Absolutely correct. After that opening, I'd like now to begin my opening statement proper. And that's this. I've said of my solicitor, my role at this interview is to advise Michael John Steele to the best of my ability. I shall intervene in this interview if he requires any legal advice or assistance or your questions become inappropriate or you make matters known in this interview which hasn't been discussed with me beforehand. Now I confirm we've had a briefing before this interview started and that briefing consisted of myself giving a one page summary and also I asked some questions and I received replies. I wish to say this, my client, having taken advice from me, has instructed me that he wishes to exercise his right to silence at this interview. I wish to say, for the benefit of the tape, that my client has been under arrest and in police custody in total since Monday the 13th for the 5th 96, when he was arrested at 10 past 3. Since 12.45 on Wednesday the 15th for the 5th 96, that's yesterday, Mr Steele has been in police custody relating to an arrest regarding importation of controlled drugs and murder. I wish to make it clear that until 11.25 on Thursday the 16th for the 5th 96, this is this morning, no information regarding this new matters of murder and the importation of controlled drugs has been given to me by the police. Any information I've gained appears to have been via local and national newspapers, including the East Anglian Daily Times and The Times. Considering the police are investigating at least two new serious arrestable offences, the disclosure of a one-page summary without evidence to justify its contents, it's wholly insufficient to allow me, as a solicitor, to advise Michael John Steele, my client, properly. The police are investigating a triple murder and importation of cannabis. I do not consider, at this stage, given the disclosure I've received, there is any evidence to link Mr Steele with either an importation of cannabis between the 1st 11th 95 and the 21st 11th 95 or in murder which is supposed to have taken place on the 6th for the 12th 95. I consider I've not received adequate let alone full disclosure. 
During this interview, the police also understand wish to ask questions about 150 kilograms of cannabis found at the premises of my client's mother. The police have confirmed to me that these drugs relate to a charge which has already been laid against my client and for which he has already been remanded in custody. Accordingly, I wish to object to the line of questioning relating to the 150 kilograms of cannabis seized on the 15th for the 5th 96. That's yesterday. If the police in this interview wish to pursue the aforementioned line of questioning, I wish to bring it to their attention that the old right to silence still applies and that accordingly no interference can be drawn on any silence my client wishes to exercise in any event. My authority for that C16.5 of the current codes of practice, as far as many questions relating to the murders are concerned. I have already stated that I have not seen any evidence implicating my client. This applies equally to the alleged importation of cannabis in November 95. Now during the meeting we had earlier on, after I was shown the one page summary, I asked the officers what written statements they had. DC Shakespeare replied, we have two databases on the home's computer system. There are at least 300 statements. I asked how many statements implicate my client. DC Shakespeare shook or shrugged his shoulders when asked that. He then said, it's not possible to provide me with those statements at the moment. When he was asked why by me, he said, they're on the computer. I asked him, can you get printouts of the relevant statements to implicate my client or the statements that implicate my client if there are any? DJ Shakespeare said, we have given what we consider to be the fullest appropriate information at this stage and we now wish to give your client his account of the incident. I then thanked you both officers, didn't I? And that was the conclusion of our discussion. However, DC Norton did, and I wish this to be fair to him, did then come speak to me and told me there was one very important thing I may want to now take notice of, and that was this. At least 150 kilograms of cannabis resin was recovered from the home address of Blank Steel. This was found in a garage contained within, DC Norton said, six holdalls. This is the current state of play regarding disclosure. I've made my comments abruptly clear. I am grateful for your giving me this time to make this opening statement. I wish to pause now because my client will now make a prepared statement which will take some time to read out. And I ask for your patience while he does this drawing which will be abruptly clear. They will not answer any further police questions and wish to us be taken to Chelmsford Prison forthwith. Mr Steele, I'm now going to allow you to read your statement. Thank you very much. Prior to doing that, I wish to remind you of your legal rights. You have the right to your free legal advice at any time whilst you're here in custody at the police station and it continues throughout the investigation. Do you understand that? I do. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you fail to mention when questioned so that you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Do you understand that? I understand that, yes. Now, some objections were raised yesterday at the court in relation to your detention at this police station and the conditions for which you're being kept in, particularly the circumstances of the room which you're being held. You've been asked by my colleague this morning in the custody area, did you have a good night's sleep? And you confirmed to him in the affirmative. That was correct, yes. Do you feel fit and well for this interview to continue? I do. I've had a good night's sleep and I don't feel any fatigue whatsoever. Okay. I know that if you refuse to have your midday meal and you feel fed and watered sufficiently to know where you are and what you're saying to us during this interview. Yes, I've refused. Not refused. I The meal was offered to me this morning, which I had a bite out of, which was the breakfast. Nothing wrong with the meal. Situation is my appetite at the moment is just no um, good enough to eat any food. That's all it is. I was told you'd refused it. No. The terminology there isn't meant to implicate or... No, I'm not. I'm not refusing nothing. It's just that my appetite isn't there at the moment. Fine, that's okay. Right. And I'd like to quickly just read this. Yes. Which is a statement that I've prepared, which I'd like to draw to your attention. On Monday the 13th of the 5th, I was arrested along with my common law wife for the past 25 years, namely Miss Jacqueline Street, the person of exemplary character. The arrest was conducted in such a manner that a near fatal accident was avoided purely by my own driving ability. Our vehicle was rammed by two plainclothes policemen driving a vehicle in a malicious and dangerous manner. My wife, who is a cancer patient, was detained for two days in squalid conditions and showed no compassion of or reasonable respect by arresting officers. 
It was made known to the police that my wife had daily duties to perform a guide and two retired horses, which are kept five miles from the home, duties which she was unable to pass on to anybody else. My wife was released and returned home after two days to find the home had been abused and damaged by the police search of the premises. No notice of this search was given to my legal representative, Mr. Christopher Bowen. Money was taken from the home, which was a loan to her from a relative pending the sale of her home. Proof can be shown in evidence provided that this money came from a perfectly legitimate source. Also taken was her own personal vehicle, which is financed to her and registered to her. In short, she has been maliciously penalised by overzealous police officers abusing police privilege. She is unable to perform daily duties because of this situation and has no one to turn to for immediate assistance. Our home is situated in a rural area and a vehicle is her livelihood. Since my arrest, I have shown every respect to arresting police officers. I've been polite and assisted them in their inquiries to date within the envelope of the law. During the search of another premises, a firearm was found and because of the death of two or three people known to me, I have been charged in connection with these killings. Abrupt forensic science will prevail and clearly exempt the weapon found at my premises. The discovery of this weapon has been used for arresting police officers to sensationalise my appearance at Chelmsford Magistrates Court yesterday morning. By releasing a press statement alleging my connection with the murder of the three people known to me, all of which is total nonsense. The entrance to the Magistrates Courts was total mayhem. The police escort to the hearing was classic choreography, with blue light flashing, driving through the red lights and along the wrong side of the street at breakneck speeds. Nothing will come of this murder charge, but the damage is clearly done. My pending trial for importation of cannabis will be the sensation of the year. The initial and main point of this statement is to make it abruptly clear at this stage that until my wife's vehicle is returned to her and I have confirmation from her that she's been given back the money taken from her, I have no intentions of taking part or assisting in any further interviews or any type of inquiry. Finally, the magistrate's hearing yesterday, Wednesday the 15th for the 5th, was to acquire further time for my presence in the police cells pending further inquiries and interviews. Since that hearing and the granting of a further three days laid down, I am still sitting in a squalid cell and have no contact with the arresting officer. It is now Thursday the 16th for the 5th. This interview commenced approximately 10 minutes ago. I'm now leaving this interview room and will not return. Resume any interviews until my wife's vehicle and money is returned to her. One other point I must make is hired items such as the chainsaws have been taken along with my own vehicle. I expect immediate returns of these items so they can get returned to their rightful owners. That's all I have to say to you and I do wish to leave. I will now and go back to the cell. Just make one thing clear. Yes, you have not been charged with murder as you've said in your statement. You've been arrested. Okay, I stand corrected. I stand corrected. On suspicion, I stand corrected. I've been involved in the murder. You have the free right to leave this room. I just want to say one thing before you go. No courts is likely to draw any advanced influences from my client interest in the light of this defence representations in this interview. Thank you, Mr. Steele. You may now leave the interview room. If you're just escorting back, Richard, I'll conclude the interview. Yeah, do you want to conclude it? And I'll just take him back. At 13.09. This interview is being tape recorded and we're in an interview room at Colchester Police Station. The date is Friday the 17th for the 5th, 96, and the time by the clock on the wall is 10.13. I'm Philip Norton, a Detective Constable from the Central Detective Unit, Police Headquarters, Chelmsford, Essex. There's another police officer in the room. It's Dietrich Shakespeare, also from the Essex Police Detective Unit at Headquarters. Thank you very much. We're here to interview Michael Steele. Michael, just give us your full name, address and date of birth, please. My name is Michael John Steele. I live at Anglers Green, Colchester. And my date of birth is the 13th of the 1242. Thank you. And your solicitor, I'm Christopher Bowen, a solicitor from Jeeps and Sons in Colchester. And now required to explain my role at this interview is to advise and assist Mr. Steele, my client, throughout. I confirm that information has been given to me. I'll go into more detail in a few minutes' time. That information has been given to me by yourselves, officers. 
I've advised my client on the information that's in my possession and he's instructed me that he wishes to exercise his right to silence. I'm now going to explain why that decision has been taken. Mr Steele has been in custody since Monday the 13th of the 5th 96 when he was arrested at 10 past 3. He was initially questioned on matters which I hope are going to be unrelated to this interview. He was remanded in a local custody by Chelmsford Magistrates Courts on Wednesday the 15th of the 5th at 12.45. It's now Friday the 17th of the 5th and as he said at the beginning of this interview when we started it was 10.30 hours. The police did not provide any information to the defence regarding the importation of controlled drugs and murder until 11.25 on Thursday the 16th of the 5th 96, nearly a full 24 hours after he was initially remanded into a local police custody for these new offences. The information provided to the defence was a single A4 sheet of paper with some information containing varying when the first briefing took place with me on 11.25 on the Thursday the 16th for the 5th. I requested written statements. I was told by DC Shakespeare that there are two databases and a home's computer system containing over 300 statements in relation to the present inquiries. When I asked how many statements implicated my client, I received no verbal response. I asked to see statements, but was told it was not possible at that time as they were on a computer. I asked for computer printouts of the state, these statements. I was informed this. We have been given what we consider to be the fullest appropriate information at this stage. And we wish now to give your client his account of the incident. The only further information I was given after this was by DC Norton, who informed me that the 150 kilograms of cannabis resin had been seized from the premises of my client's mother. Since the above has occurred, my client took part in a tape recorded interview where it was made very clear he did not wish to answer any questions and left the room. That was yesterday. The police now wish to put questions to Mr. Steele about the importation of cannabis, murder, and understand wish to question him about an offence which has already been charged. However, no police disclosure has been made to me or my client by the police. I invite you officers at this juncture to suspend this interview to provide me with disclosure of evidence. I'll let you reply to that at the end of this introduction. My client faces allegations relating to two serious arrestable offences, one of which concerns a triple murder. You wish him to answer your questions. Before I can properly assist Mr Steele on the alleged evidence against him, I need as his solicitor to be aware of that evidence. I am not aware of it as you refuse to provide me with adequate, let alone full disclosure. Since the start of your present inquiries into my client, I've been given inaccurate information by police officers. Information has been given in court by the prosecutor, which was denied to me beforehand despite me asking directly about the information I required. On too many occasions to mention, I have requested disclosure of evidence. I have done so in this interview. The police tell me they have given me the fullest appropriate information at this stage indeed. Superintendent Story told me this morning during a telephone call. I believe this to be untrue. At Chelmsford Magistrates Court on Wednesday the 15th of the 5th, mention was made of a Land Rover, which apparently could be linked to my client. I was told that this would be relevant to the murder inquiry. When I was asked questions about this Land Rover at Chelmsford Magistrate Court, certain information was withheld from me. I noticed from this briefing sheet that the Land Rover is not mentioned in it. This is one clear example of the degenerous behaviour of the police in this inquiry into two serious arrestable offences. The police are clearly withholding vital information which I require to properly advise my client. Without it, I, as a solicitor, am in no position to advise him on the strength of the evidence against him. If I cannot do that, his only proper course of action which advise him to do so is exercise his right to silence at this interview. I ask you to respect his right to silence. Before I close, DC Shakespeare, I ask you to refrain from seeking to undermine the confidence Mr Steele and I have in each other. Yesterday, you incorrectly told me that he was considering terminating his instructions to my firm. You've acknowledged that you'd done this on yesterday's taped interview. This morning, during a telephone call by you to my office, you told me that I did not need to come to the police station this morning, that the police would find the new solicitor for my client. I can only summarise that you did this to put pressure on me and hence my client. I find this totally unprofessional and ask you to refrain from any continuation of this improper behaviour. 
I have on no occasion refused to come to the police station. Indeed, I believe I have come to this police station at the earliest possible opportunity when I've been summoned to do so. As a result of everything I've said, my client has lost any faith in the conduct of this police investigation. I can understand why. Before I conclude this interview, my opening comment and allow you to begin this interview, I ask you to provide my client and I with all the evidence you have against him. Thank you. Finished, okay? I invite you to reply to my questions, please. I've just a number of things to say before in reply to what you said, Mr. Steele. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Do you understand that? You have the right to free legal advice at any stage of this inquiry, whether it be by person now or by using the telephone. Do you understand that? Well, yesterday served on your solicitor a briefing note so that we can be clear and you can be clear in any accusations that is being made against you. You're in police cells for the most serious offence of being concerned in the murder of Patrick Tate, Anthony Tucker and Craig Rolfe. You're also in custody at this police station at this stage in relation to conspiring with others to import controlled drugs, namely cannabis resin, into this country. You cannot be unclear at this time to those other accusations being made. Within the briefing though, it states that the police have information that between the 1st 11th 95 and the 21st 11th 95, you along with others conspired to import these controlled drugs and the persons mentioned were yourself, Jack Wombs, Peter Corey, Darren Nichols, Patrick Tate, Anthony Tucker and Craig Rolfe. On this briefing note, the information will show and suggest that once imported and distributed, the cannabis resin was found to be of very poor quality or part of it was found to be poor quality and as a result, part of it was returned and a refund was demanded. This brought about a breakdown in the relationships between you and your conspirators. There was a loss of face and credibility between the group. There is also information in relation that a number of you travelled to Ofsted where Tate and Rolf were handed back a cash refund in relation to that drug deal. I intend to begin this interview to ask you questions in relation to that. We have given what we consider to be the fullest appropriate information at this stage and I wish to give you the opportunity of giving your account of that allegation and incident. Do you wish to make any comment in relation to that? I would like to intervene at this moment. I'm grateful for you reading through the briefing sheet I can only say again that this briefing sheet contains very little detail. It contains concerns, allegations that you believe my client has been involved. I ask you please again to disclose me the evidence that you have which will presumably back up the allegations you're making. So far I've not seen any evidence and I would like to see some evidence so I can properly advise my client and update my advice to him. At the moment I can only repeat what I've said at the beginning. I am in no position to properly advise him as to the strength of the evidence against him. I cannot do that is only recourse at this interview. Any sensible recourse that he has is to remain silent. If you wish to disclose further information, then please, please do so, because I would only be too happy to further take instructions from my client. You wanted my client to have another interview, and I've given you full cooperation by getting this interview arranged in this interview room that we're having here at the moment. But until we get any further information, my client will be saying absolutely nothing as is right. Thank you very much. What I would say is, I don't need to read all that out again because the police say that you cannot be unclear about the reasons for your detentions at this police station at this time. I would like to say something to that. He's not. I'm certain not unclear as to the reasons for his detention. He's been arrested on suspicion of importation of cannabis. That's correct. And murder. The point at this interview. Before I can properly advise him, I have to know what strength of the evidence there is. And I think there is a difference between the reasons for his arrest and the strength of the evidence to back up the reasons for his arrest. And that's why my position is this. It's the evidence we're saying that we want to see, not the reason. I'm quite clear why he's in the police station. I'm not speaking for him. I'm speaking for myself. I'm quite clear. But what I would like to do is advise him as to the evidence. The interference. The interference from that is, as of course the fact of your solicitor is clear in the reasons for your detention. You cannot be unclear, so I wish to continue if you don't mind with this interview. Please continue with this interview, but I wish to make absolutely clear, Mr Steele is going to say nothing at this interview. Yes, you've made your observations pretty clear. 
both during the magistrate's court and the number of representations your solicitor has made to us and to our senior investigating officer whilst we have attempted to conduct this inquiry and interview as expeditiously as we feel that we could. There have been a number of delays, obviously in the nature of the complex inquiry that it has been, and to ensure that we as investigating officers were in full possession of accurate facts at all stages. We felt that at certain times we needed to take time before coming and approaching you, and that is our situation now. In relation to the accusation of conspiracy, do you know Patrick Tate? Do you know Anthony Tucker? Do you know Craig Rolfe? Did you conspire with these persons prior to the 21st 11th 95 to import drugs into this country on the 8th and 9th of November 95? Did you have numerous contacts with those persons mentioned via the telephone prior to that date? Evidence will show that your mobile telephone number was in contact with Patrick Tate and Anthony Tucker as was your home telephone number prior to that date on the 8th of November. Can I interrupt you there and ask why? Why this will show? Why they won't show it at the moment? You can interrupt me, but I will continue with my line of questioning. You don't wish to answer the question then? I will continue with my line of questioning. Police will show, in relation to that, that Patrick Tate phoned you on the evening of the 9th of November 95 to ensure that even though you had been arrested, the controlled substances were secure. I would just like to ask, if I may, just referring to that phone call that we say that you took from Patrick Tate on that evening, if you can recollect that phone call at all, and if there's anything you can tell us about what you may have discussed with him during the course of that telephone conversation. Please carry on, my client's not going to say anything. Did you conspire with those persons prior to that date? Did you enter into agreement with Tate, Tucker and Rolf to concern yourself in the supply of controlled drugs, and indeed, the importation of those drugs. Very soon after it became clear that the drugs were of poor quality. A cash refund was demanded. You travelled to Ostend. You were joined at Ostend by Patrick Tate. Anthony, beg your pardon, Craig Rolfe. Three girls, a man and a female. You hand over the refund. Your barking card was used to pay the bill. The Burlington Hotel, Ostend, relating to that period of time for which you were in the country. I would just like to ask what you were doing in Ostend at that time. Any legitimate reason why you should have been over there? Please carry on, my client's not going to answer any questions. I'm thinking. After that period of time, you returned to the country as did the other persons I've mentioned. You then began to conspire with Tate and Tucker in relation to another importation of controlled drugs. You were seen to attend the home address of Anthony Tucker to pick up cash to pay for that new importation. You supposedly continued to organise this importation, which led to the incident on the 6th of December 95, when the three persons as mentioned were murdered in a lane in Retterdon. Some of the facts I've gone through already in this interview and ask you to make comment have been confirmed by Darren Nichols, who is in custody at this time, giving a full account of his movements, his association with you, his telephone calls with you, his conversations with you. Mr Steele, I advise you not to make any comment anyway, but as far as Mr Nichols is concerned, you say he's in custody, but I'm not aware of what he said. I have no details of what he said. I couldn't possibly advise you to comment on matters I'm unaware of, so Mr Steele, please feel free to continue to remain silent. Michael, just so that you're perfectly clear, we're saying that when you were detained by my colleagues from the Customs and Excise on the 8th of November, 95, Following your boat having been impounded on the beach at Felixstowe, we are saying that was the occasion that the cannabis was then found to be of poor quality. It was actually brought into this country, and if you hear us refer to it between ourselves in this interview that we call it the bad cannabis conspiracy, that's what we're referring to. The conspiracy that occurred between the 1st 11th 95 and the 21st 11th 95. So again, just to make it clear, in your own mind, that is what we're saying, that the bad cannabis was brought in. All the cannabis of poor quality, anyway. In relation to the actual incident, the actual physically bringing that load into the country, is there anything at this stage that you wish to say to me about your involvement or any knowledge that you have in that offence? If I pause at something because I'm thinking, I accept the fact you're going to stay silent. On the 21st 11th 95, 
As we've said, your Barclay card was used to pay a bill at a Burlington Hotel at Ostend. Can you tell me how you travelled out to the continent on that occasion? By which means? Could you tell me if you travelled with anybody else on that occasion? Is it possible for you to give me any reason as to why you was in Ostend on that date? Is it possible for you to tell me who else may have access to your Barclay card? Can you confirm to me whether or not that it was you that actually signed the bill at the Ostend Hotel on that date? I'd like to ask you about your relationship with a girl by the name of Sarah Saunders, who was the girlfriend of Patrick Tate. And I would ask if there was anything you'd like to tell me about your relationship with her. Could you tell me what your relationship is with a man by the name of Nichols, who, as you're aware, is in custody as part of this, of those offences? Could you tell me anything about your relationship with him? As it's clear from the briefing sheet that has been given to your solicitor and also now read over to by my colleague, it is the police's view that you have been involved in the murder of Tony Tucker, Tate and Craig Rolfe. Nichols has, during the course of a number of interviews with other colleagues of mine, given information with regard to that particular offence. That's information, of course, has just been given to me, isn't it, D.C. Shakespeare? I'll continue with my questions, Mr. Steele. Can you confirm that you first met Darren Nichols while she was in custody at Hollisley Bay a number of years ago? Is it true that Darren Nichols is an associate of yours who has, over a period of time, done a number of jobs for you, including work at your cottage at Meadow Cottage in Clacton? Can you confirm to me, or deny in fact, that in December 94, on a date as yet unknown, you travelled to Amsterdam in company? Sorry, I've gone too far there. Can you confirm that in November 95, sorry, on a date unknown in 94, Darren Nichols travelled to Amsterdam at your behest together with another person's and went to a premises at your behest known as Stone's Bar. Is there anything you'd like to tell me about that premises in Amsterdam? Do you know anyone in Amsterdam by the name of Stone? Is it true that on that occasion you paid the sum of £1,000 to Darren Nichols for travelling to Amsterdam in company with a male called Peter on that occasion? Is it true that Darren Nichols subsequently worked for you at Meadow Cottage in a period of November 95 where he cleaned a barn at premises at Meadow Cottage in preparation for a bonfire night celebration? Moving on specifically to the allegation of the conspiracy involving you and the bad cannabis importation, again for the period the 1st of November 95 to the 21st of November 95. Is it true that following those drugs being importated into this country, we say by yourself that you gave Darren Nichols 50 kilograms of cannabis, which he tells us he took and placed in the boot of a car, which was then under his control in Braintree. Did you ask Darren Nichols to do that, Mr Steele? Darren Nichols tells us that he went out with you to Holland via Harwich on a ferry where he was with you met the Stones brothers that I've mentioned as being from Stones Bar in Amsterdam. Did you travel to Holland on that occasion with Darren Nichols? I'd like to say at this point that much of the information, most of the information given at this interview has not been given to me beforehand. As far as the Stones brothers are concerned, I've never heard those names before and I object to information being given at this interview which hasn't been given to me beforehand. I'm not going to stop the interview at this stage because my client is going to remain silent. We are clearly saying that once again to reiterate the point Mr Steele that subsequently and you'll find out that because of the bad feeling that existed subsequently between yourself and we say Pat Tate and Tony Tuck in particular regards to the bad cannabis importation, that was one of the main reasons why you felt so aggrieved to have get involved in the shooting and the murder of those three men. Did you have anything to do, Mr Steele, with the murder of Tony Tucker, Pat Tate and Craig Rolfe? As I've explained to you, Darren Nichols has told us that you went out to Holland with him where you met up with the Stones brothers and they repaid you the sum of £170,000, a mixture of sterling and gilders, which was repayment to you from them for the bad cannabis. That's new information as far as the solicitor is concerned. Did you then get into a cab, Mr. Steele, with Darren Nichols and travel from Amsterdam Railway Station to Ostend? When you were in Ostend, Mr. Steele, did you phone Pat Tate and your associate Jack Wombs? Would you like to tell me how much Patrick Tate's share of the money that was repaid to you by the Stones Brothers was to be repaid to him? 
Darren Nichols tells is that Tate and the other people that have been mentioned to you by my colleague subsequently met up with you in Ostend, obviously for the purposes of sharing up the monies that you'd been repaid by the Stones brothers. Is there anything you'd like to tell me about that particular repayment and how it came about? Darren Nichols tells us that yourself, Tate, Rolf and the others had a meet in Ostend and he had a bit of a jolly, a few beers together. And then you subsequently went out for a meal with Darren Nichols and you were joined during the course of that meal by Jack Wombs. Is that correct? And then you carried on back, coming back to the UK where Darren Nichols carried on working for you at Meadow Cottage. Do you know anyone by the name Mr. Steele of Mullock? I've never heard of the name Mullock before. I'm the solicitor and you can spell the name Mullock for me, please, DC Shakespeare. Mr. Steele, I believe it's spelled M-U-L-O-O-C-K. Thank you, Mr. Shakespeare. But don't hold me to that. That's how I believe it is. Anything that you can tell me about that name and anybody that you've known by that name, because it is alleged by Darren Nichols that you told him that Pat Tate, one of the men who subsequently murdered, was the sum of £40,000 from the Mullock brothers in relation to the bad cannabis importation. And that money was obviously owed back to the Mullock brothers. However, they spell their name. They are obviously going to be looking for their money back. Does that name mean anything to you? Do these circumstances mean anything to you that I've outlined? It transpires, I understand, from Darren Nichols that about one third of the poor cannabis that you brought back into the country, we say was sellable, i.e. was of sufficient quality that you were able to make some money on it. And that Patrick Tate, he says, took those drugs up north somewhere in this country and presumably did with that what he wanted. Well, I wouldn't imagine that you'd have been very happy about that, would you, Mr. Steele? Would you like to tell me about a relationship that Sarah Saunders has with your common law wife, Jackie Street? Are they friends? Have you ever at any stage, Mr. Steele, paid any monies to Sarah Saunders in relation to property to maintain her lifestyle? On the 8th of the 11th, 95, the day that you brought the bad cannabis importation into the UK, Pat Tate, as my colleagues outlined to you, was arrested on a drink driving charge in South End when he was driving a Porsche belonging to Tony Tucker. That, of course, was the same day, as I've said, you were stopped on the beach. Were you aware that Pat Tate had in fact been arrested on that same day? Was there ever an occasion, Mr. Steele, when yourself, Patrick Tate and perhaps Darren Nichols, Sarah Saunders were together at a house to mend a cooker? Does that ring any bells to you at all? Darren Nichols has told us that, um, can we just stop there a moment? Yes, let's stop the interview. I just want to say something. If you want to console your solicitor in private, fine. Let us stop, Mr. Steele, yes. Okay, just fine. I don't want a period of time. I just want to... If you want to do it in private... Yes, two seconds. I'd be happy to speak in front of these officers because we have the right to. Well, basically, yeah. What you were saying just then, I didn't quite... You've got some notes there, haven't you? I have some notes here. Let's stop the interview. I mean, it's 40 minutes gone. Let's have a break here. We can start a new tape in a few minutes time. Can we have a cup of tea? Yes, I think a break would be a good idea at this stage. Please, officers, if you don't mind. Okay, it's 10.54 and we'll have a short break.